having the actual intangible cultural heritage in the museum itself is difficult, though um, sort of documentation of it is possible, I would say. Um, so this is something that we're kind of struggling with a lot of museums now. How can we try to integrate this into exhibitions, which is one of the core um, activities of a museum. So um, as I just explained, um, we have a lot of research methods that try to document um, intangible cultural heritage and a lot of times we do apply this very closely to our collections items as well. Um, we have a real, I would say, intangible cultural heritage led kind of way of acquiring um, objects for our collection and I'm documenting. Um, one important factor in our museum collections is that none of all of our collections items are antique, um, so they're not all old. Uh, we have items in our exhibit that are um, over a hundred years old and we have objects in our, in our exhibit um, and in our collections that are one year old. Um, so we have things from um, all types of um, origins. Um, and this goes again with our objective to try to document the traditional but also examine the modern or the contemporary um, way that people show their culture. Um, exhibitions, how do we integrate um, intangible cultural heritage into exhibits? One of the things we do is um, displaying objects with more about the objects themselves, the purpose um, of the object, how it's used, information about the maker, stories about the object. Um, one thing I left out, and you can't really see there, that is currently in our exhibits also at the, for each of the ethnic groups that we show, uh, we have a photograph of a person there and we have a quote from that person. So it's part of this trying to lend a voice to the people that are being shown in the exhibits. So people can hear something here, I guess, something that they've said. We didn't have the budget for actual audio, but it's written down. Um, we do try to use videos and audio recordings and, and photos wherever possible. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, and another thing that, another step we've taken is trying to bring in community members to help us develop the exhibit. So community members um, can play many different roles in, in um, exhibition development. Um, they can just provide information through interviews and you know us going out and getting information from them. It is possible to do collaborative research. It depends on who you're working with. Um, as I said, we've been trying to work with community researchers, but it is pretty complex. A lot of the communities we work in, they have no concept of a museum or no concept of why we would be gathering, getting this kind of information. So working with them kind of on researchers or creating an exhibition is, is in itself pretty complicated. Uh, loaning objects. Um, we have had community members loan us pieces for exhibits and then take them back. Uh, also, finally, then education and outreach activities. Um, we do, well, this isn't finally, but um, we do, do a lot of different work in education outreach. We think this is a very important part of ICH, um, particularly in a country where, in a place where the majority culture um, in Lompabang really doesn't always integrate all of the minority cultures or recognize them. Uh, we do have a library. We have schools that visit to do um, we have schools that visit us that we do tours and activities with, um, and we also go to schools to do activities as well. Um, we have a small group that do, does that. Um, we do training of guides, like I mentioned. Um, Laos is a very, or Lompabang is a very big tourism destination, and a lot of visitors are starting to go to ethnic communities. Um, so one of the things we try to do is we're part of the government guides training program, and we give a one-day course on how to guide um, visitors when you're uh, when it comes to interpreting ethnic minority cultures. Um, we also sponsor ethnic youth interns, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, and as I mentioned, we've started doing museum capacity building. So just in May, actually, we went down to the south of Laos to work with the provincial museum that's trying to develop an, um, an, eth an ethnographic kind of exhibit. Um, and advocacy and livelihoods development. I mentioned to you about our museum shop. Um, this is important, this is basically the, the crux of our, or the main part of our livelihoods um, development program. That's a picture of our shop as well as one of the bracelets we have. Um, so everything that's in our shop, pretty much, except for our postcards and books, are village handicrafts and they're all made with 
using traditional skills and for the most part traditional materials, but not always. Um, so we have textiles, bamboo baskets, um, embroidery, silver, applique, batik. We have some pottery as well. It's primarily from communities in which we do research, but it's also from other ethnic minority communities. Um, sometimes we have their development projects that work with handicrafts with communities and we try to provide an outlet for the sale of their handicrafts. Um, an average of 50% of our shop income goes back to the communities and to the artisans who are primarily women. Um, and again, this is one of the things that I mentioned in the beginning, that in a country that um, where the communities are as rural and poor as they are in Laos, it's quite important that they can't just think about what it means to be Yao. Um, part of it is also, you know, finding a livelihood that will sustain them and their family. Um, so we see this as an important source of income for a lot of the vulnerable communities we work with. Um, and what we also see is that it promotes the use and the transmission of traditional skills and knowledge. Um, there's a debate whether it's always good to commercialize some of these skills, you know, that the only reason they're doing embroidery now is because they can sell it. But there's also the discussion that if they didn't have a way to earn money from this traditional skill, they might not practice it at all. Um, and what we also see is that in, um, this can be an important source of income to um, help families not feel the need to sell a lot of their cultural artifacts. Um, one thing that we noticed very early on in our research is that a lot of communities had sold, um, sold um, important religious artifacts or, or cultural artifacts because of drought, because of, you know, um, emergencies. And so uh, this was a way of trying to create income so that they wouldn't have to sell off um, kind of their more traditional pieces. And uh, finally, when we're talking about advocacy, um, we are trying to move more and more into an advocacy kind of role, advocate role. So meaning um, we're trying to create, promote uh, more appreciation for ethnic minority cultures. So this can be through exhibits, through the education activities. We're trying to develop a festival at the moment. Um, we are trying to also foster pride in identity building within ethnic minority communities. Um, through handicrafts and through the interns. Um, and we would like to move more into revitalization activities. However, this requires much more time in the villages, which is one of the challenges we'll discuss, um, and requires very different expertise and funding. Um, so this is a real challenge, I would say. Um, and another thing that we're looking at at the moment um, is kind of community museums or a new term that I'm hearing more and more is eco-museums. So how can communities themselves um, create a way to, com to communicate their own culture for, for visitors? <laughs>